it's so crazy how the well the the Tunguska asteroid, which was in nineteen or eight, when was it? Nineteen oh eight. Nineteen oh eight, and it it exploded five miles in the air. Yes, and it still caused so much devastation to the surface of the Earth. About eight hundred and twenty miles of old growth taiga forest was decimated, completely just blown over. These are trees two and three feet thick. I forget what it was, 80 million trees instantly snapped off like they're twigs. The, the force of that, that explosion was about equivalent to a 15 megaton, maybe 20 megaton in that range, a hydrogen bomb. Now, in the peak of the Cold War, the uh, largest bomb, the largest warhead deployed by the U.S. was roughly 15 megatons. Really? And that was, you know, that was part of the whole mutual assured destruction that, you know, if, if the, the Soviet Union launched a first strike at us, we would have enough retaliatory capacity to still completely wipe them out. And so one 15 megaton hydrogen bomb is enough to wipe out any metropolitan urban area on the earth. I mean, think about this. Let's see. If I go 15 megatons, that's 15 million tons of TNT. Now, to give you a comparison, that would be the equivalent of 1,500 uh, atomic bombs that destroyed Hiroshima. That's, that's unfathomable. Yeah, that's one hydrogen bomb warhead, right? 15 megatons. Actually, no, it's more than that because the, 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 uh, the bomb that took out Hiroshima was only about 10,000 kilotons. So, you know, it, 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 it'd be even more than that. But it gives you an idea. I think the, the Nagasaki... One, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, they, they detonated those in the air as well. That's right. Why did they do it in the air? Because the radius of destruction is greater in the atmosphere because if it strikes the ground a lot of that energy is absorbed by the ground mm. right so if you want to knock over the maximum number of buildings and kill the maximum number of people you detonate it in the atmosphere now that's exactly what the Tengu happened with the tunguska object now as it turns out there's no known direct deaths from that because it mm -hmm. was so remote uh, in fact it was so remote that it took leonid kulik I think 19 years later, he finally was able to get to the site. And, you know, it was, it was um, very disorienting to him as he uh, ascended this ridge and then looked out for the first time and saw the, the remnants of this destruction. Now, if you look at any modern urban area, and in fact, I think I have in here a map of, say, Atlanta. It's got a 285 as the surrounding perimeter freeway. Um, Washington, D.C. has roughly the same size of perimeter freeway. The area within that freeway, which is the entire metropolitan area of Atlanta plus the outlying suburbs, um, is about the, roughly the area of devastation of the Tunguska blast. So, again, a Tunguska, one object. And, and see, here's the thing. The How big was that object? I was about to say, here's okay. the thing. It's about 50 meters in diameter, which means roughly 160 feet. So that, that, that's a, a, a baby. That's a cosmic speck that we're talking about there. I mean, the Chelyabinsk, it happened in, was it 2013, also over little town of Siberia. That was like only a tenth the size, if even that, of the Tunguska object. It detonated like, what was it, 15 miles up? But it still caused 1,500 injuries. Nobody was killed. But it caused 1,500 injuries, some of them serious, and it also damaged 7,000 buildings. And I don't know if you've ever seen some of the, the, the video clips of that, but, you know, when the... Uh, I don't think I have. Yeah, the, the, the sound wave, the, 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 the shock wave, when that thing hit is pretty mind-boggling. Where did it hit? It's a little town called Chelyabinsk, also in Siberia. So... Um, yeah, so it was not anywhere close to the magnitude of the Tunguska object. Mm -hmm. But there's a possibility that it also was part of the same torrid meteor stream. There's a, art, there's a paper that just came out on um, new studies of the torrid meteor stream that think that it might, they've actually referred to it as the smoking gun for the Younger Dryas event. So what are the theorized locations for some sort of an impact 
during the Younger Dryas? Like, uh, I'm sure, you know, this is the big question, but... Uh, well, just like with the Cretaceous tertiary impact that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, for 10 years, the critics said, well, we're not buying this scenario because you can't produce a crater. You know, if there was a huge impact 66 million years ago that wiped out all of the dinosaurs on Earth, where's the crater, all right? So it took 10 years, but then the crater was found, and it's buried under like a half a mile of limestone on the northern Yucatan Peninsula. And subsequent studies have confirmed over and over again that, yes, it's a buried crater, it's, which is called an astrobleem, which literally translates as star wound, a star wound. What was the name of the, the rock that hit, that killed the dinosaurs? Well, it doesn't really have a name, but the crater is called the Cheek Shalub. The Cheek Shalub. Cheek Shalub. Cheek Shalub. And that's the name of a little Mayan village that sits on the northern coast of uh, the Yucatan. Now, here's <laughs> some of this stuff where it kind of gets bizarre and takes us back to some of these ideas like geomythology and astromythology. Like, there's no way they could have possibly known about it, right? Mm -hmm. But, and again, I can pull up here and we'll look at the look at the the ground penetrating radar surveys of the giant 120 130 mile wide uh scar in your surface astrobleem star wound right now typically God, that's how big it is that's insane yeah yeah i know <sighs> yeah so and, and you know that was probably not the only impact at that time right um anyways uh if you look at the structure of these large impact events there, there, there's several things that characterize them. They're, they have multi, multiple rings because you've all seen, you throw a rock in a pond, rings mm -hmm. emanate out. Right. And right where the, where the, if you throw a rock in the pond, it's going to be a splash that comes up, right, and immediately falls back down. Well, in an impact like that, a hypervelocity impact, it basically liquefies the crust, and it sends multiple rings moving out, but they're rapidly cooling as they move out, and then at some point they, they cool enough that they crystallize, and they sort of get locked into the landscape. So you can see the multiple rings, and then at the center there will be a central uplift that usually forms a peak, right? And that peak is where the, the ground, this molten ground is rebounding, and then it'll come up, and then it'll literally, like, freeze freeze, and crystallize and create this up, upward peak. This is called the central peak. Mm -hmm. So the Cretaceous tertiary impact, the Chicxulub impact, has a central peak. And it's directly in the center, and sitting on the ground surface, above where that central peak is, is the little town of Chicxulub, which is a Mayan term. Interestingly, in the court, just only be a coincidence, right? The translation of cheek shalub literally means the horn of the devil. Oh my God. So I've always thought that was rather interesting. Cheek shalub. Cheek shalub. Cheek shalub. That's it. Yeah. Cheek shalub. And that town is right basically in the center of that crater. Yeah. Well, it's not a crater because it's buried. Right. It's an astrobleem. So you'd have to strip away like half a mile of limestone to, to get to the thing. So it's buried. You can't, you, the, the only indication that it's there is the ring of cenotes that, that, that sit just inside the rim of the great buried crater. And these are essentially like solution, almost like potholes, um, uh, collapsed caverns that have formed in the limestone. Mm -hmm. And that ring of cenotes forms... Um, it delineates uh, the rim of the giant underground crater, and um, which is interesting because these cenotes, many of them were considered sacred to the Mayans for various reasons. You know, the northern Yucatan Peninsula is composed of porous limestone, and so there's no overground rivers. All the rivers flow north there, and they flow under. Mm -hmm. They flow under the surface of the ground. But they're linked into this gigantic, unfathomably huge labyrinth of these underground caves and tunnels that are the result of water percolating through this fractured limestone created by the impact. Oh.